Please be seated. So about a month ago, we were supposed to have the Blackwell Lecture Series, and the hurricane hit. And uh, our special guest had uh, contacted me, communicated, and said, you know, we probably should wait. And I said, yes, we should wait. And, but God's delays are not God's denials. I believe that. Do you believe that? Y'all can amen so much better than that. I just know you can. Don't make me get my shirt out, okay? So we're so glad that yesterday we are able to have the change agent workshop, and Oz Hillman led us in, in that, and it was a wonderful blessing. And today we're blessed that he's able to be here to, to share God's message for us. Oz is the founder and the president of Marketplace Leaders Ministry, and it's a ministry that's been going on with a major purpose, one purpose, and that is to, to equip and, and to train people in their calling to be out in the workplace as Christian workers and business owners, to be a witness for Christ in that way. I'm glad he's here today to share God's message in the back after service in the narthex. There's a table where you'll find some resources. He is the author of 18 books. The latest one is The Joseph Calling, and he's going to share a little bit about that today. Would you welcome Oz Hillman this morning? Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Well, yesterday we were doing our workshop, and about midway we got the report that some football team was losing badly. <laughs> Could that be your team? <laughs> but then when uh, Pastor Rick and I were having lunch, there had been a big change. Wow, congratulations. I found out that my, my school, uh, University of South Carolina, uh, they were down too. And then 30 seconds left, they kicked a field goal. And the guy had already kicked two field goals and missed them. So he, he got the third one and, and won the game. So... It's great to be part of an overcoming situation, isn't it? You know, many of us have had to overcome obstacles in our life. And, you know, I want to ask you a question. Yesterday I asked it uh, of the people that were in our workshop. I, I said, how many of you are in full-time Christian work? How many of you are in full-time Christian work? Raise your hand. This is a trick question, okay? How many of you are full-time Christians? Okay, all right. Now, how many of you are in full-time Christian work? Okay, all right. Now, we got that right. You may get your check a different place, but you're, you're never a part-time Christian, are you? You know, I like to say uh, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ masquerading as a businessman. Gets the emphasis right, doesn't it? And so... Yesterday, we, we talked about what it means to really see our lives in the context of living the larger story of our life. You know, so many times we settle for a secondary story rather than the story, the story that we're going to be proud of when we get to heaven, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, my journey, um, I came to Christ when I was about 24 years old in the mid-70s. And I was, I, I've been enjoying getting to know Pastor Rick. He reminds me so much of the pastor who led me to Christ years ago. I'm still in relationship with him. He's 82 years old. I, I spoke to him yesterday. Uh, we talk every week. He's like a father to me. And... Uh, I appreciate a true pastor's heart, and uh, you have one in Pastor Rick. But I want to share with you today uh, something I discovered in writing my book, The Joseph Calling, Six Stages to Discover, Navigate, and Fulfill Your Purpose. And, uh, you know, I first heard about this concept of a Joseph Calling uh, back in 1996, I was two years into a very, very difficult season. I'd lost over a half a million dollars, 80% of my business. My wife left me, and I was in a place of just questioning my faith. 
I didn't know what was up or down. I'd been very successful in having an ad agency for 12 years, and we were doing well with American Express and Steinway Pianos and a number of high-profile type clients, but all of a sudden, my world changed dramatically. And uh, so two years into that journey, someone sent me an audio tape by a man named Gunnar Olsen from the International Christian Chamber of Commerce in Sweden. And on that tape, he said, God is raising up Josephs all over the world. And it's often signified by them going through extraordinary adversity in their business and personal life. Well, that was about all I heard on the tape. I said, I got I to gotta meet this guy. He, he has some insight about what I'm walking through. And so I found out he was going to be in Washington in two months. So I flew to Washington, and he was gracious enough to meet with me the very night of a 75-nation conference, if you can imagine that. And, and so I shared my story with him, and he turns to me, and he says, Oz, you have a Joseph calling on your life. And I said, what is that? He says, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a marketplace call that you are a spiritual and physical provider for others, just like Joseph in the Bible. But your life is really earmarked by the adversity. You, you're actually known by the adversity you, you go through. And not everybody has that type of calling, but you do. And he, so he pulled out a napkin. And he, he drew a diagram. He said, here's where you are, and here's where you'll go next, and here's the next stage. And little would I know how prophetic he would be that day. And now I've been to 26 countries and um, written 18 books. And I, during that season, I started writing a little devotional called TGIF Today, God is First, that I was really writing it for me to help me get through that season. I started sharing it with other people, and it just got a, caught on, and it got on an Internet site, and, and people started writing me from around the world. And today, over 150,000 people a day get it, and they pass it along in 104 countries. And I, I had to think, God turned the Valley of Achor, mean, which means trouble, to a door of hope. That's Hosea 2.15. And... God turned me into an overcomer just because I pressed into him and allowed him to work in the midst of my own pain. Now, in the process of going through that journey over the years, I, I, as I was preparing to write my new book on the Joseph Calling, even though I've been teaching it for many years, I decided to really write an in-depth book on the Joseph process using the life of Joseph, but I also found that many of the biblical leaders in the Bible had these six unique stages they all went through to fulfill the larger story of their life. And I thought, wow, I saw those six stages in my life. I saw them in Joseph's life. I saw them in Moses' life. I saw them in David's life. I saw them in the Apostle Paul's life. And I realized this is a process that God uses to raise up his leaders to fulfill their larger story. And so I want to share those stages with you today. The first one is recruitment. God often recruits us through a crisis. The door to our larger story is often through a crisis event. Just think about the Apostle Paul. What was the crisis event? He got struck blind. By Jesus. How about, how about David? What was his event? He was thrust, he was delivering food for his troops one day, and that afternoon he delivered a nation from Goliath. His life would forever be changed. But then his training ground became fleeing Saul's sword because he was so successful and it caused jealousy with Saul. Or how about Martin Luther? who posted some theses on a door which led him into the Protestant Reformation and as a result, you know, is known for that. He didn't grow up one day thinking, oh, I'm going to be head of the Protestant Reformation one day. <laughs> he was thrust into a crisis. Or how about Martin Luther King? Martin Luther King was 26 years old when a woman decided not to give up her seat on the bus. And he took up a cause, and you know the rest of the story. So, 
Many times when there's a crisis, you need to think about that crisis and say, okay, this might be something God's bringing me into that's going to lead me into something even greater in my life. Even the disciples, when they were in the boat, when they looked out on the ocean, they thought it was a ghost. But what did that lead to? It led to Peter getting out of the boat and walking on the water. Perception is not always reality, is it? <laughs> Number two is character development. So often God takes us into that crisis, but then he uses that season to develop our character. And, and Joseph went through 13 years of character development. He was betrayed by his own brothers. He sold into slavery, and then he was accused for something he didn't do. And God used that to really turn a 30-year-old in someone who could be trusted for prime minister of a nation. So often that's the process. And he used uh, David, the whole fleeing of Saul's sword. That, that was a process that he used to prepare him to be a king. And so I discovered that there was four reasons that will often go through adversity. The first one is simply a consequence of the call. Joseph went through his adversity because of a consequence of the call in his life. It wasn't because he was an immature teenager that contributed to the process. <laughs> he was part of a dysfunctional family and a favored son, but ultimately God was allowing this to put him in a position to save a nation, and he would later understand that. So character development, the second reason that we might go through adversity would be sin. Gehazi was the assistant to Elisha, and Elisha healed a general. And uh, Gehazi thought that that was a big deal. This guy has money, so we should benefit from that. And so he went after the general and said, uh, uh, we think you should make a payment for that. And, well, God wasn't pleased with that. He, it was not supposed to be done for for money, and so he was stricken with leprosy, and he lost his job. So sin can contribute to our adversity, and the third reason we can go through adversity is because of our, our position as a son or a daughter. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says that God is going to treat us like sons and daughters, which means that there'll be times where we're going to have to be disciplined in order for us to fulfill the purpose and destiny for our life and to bring us up into the maturity and to be more like Jesus. And so he allows certain things to happen for that purpose. And the fourth reason we can go through adversity is spiritual warfare. John 10.10 says that Jesus, uh, that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy that's his mission statement. In fact, it's interesting you see two mission statements in that one verse. Satan's, steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus, and then says Jesus comes to give us life and life abundantly. Two contrasting things there. And so, those are the reasons that we might go through adversity. The third stage is isolation. And so often what I found was that God would allow his leader to get isolated for a season. And I like to say he turns messes into messages and messengers through that isolation. You know, David was cast out and he had to go to the cave of Adullam. In fact, this was probably the most difficult time for David because he's He's fleeing Saul, and, and in order to get away, far enough away, he has to go through a town that happens to be the town where Goliath lived. And uh, the king of that town, he had to pass through there. And, and in order to get through there, he faked madness. And the king believed he was mad, so he didn't feel that he was a threat. Now, you know you've gotten to the bottom when you have to fake madness, right? Right? to stay alive. But that's what happened. And so he, he goes to the, a place called the Cave of Adullam. And there he, it's his hideout. And he stays there. And it says that, 
You know, we learn that he wrote three psalms while he was in the cave of Adalom. Messes into messages, messengers. Now, I find that story kind of humorous because sometimes, you know, in the passage it says, and then David was there all alone and his family joined him and 400 of the most misfit people joined him as well. Now, which is worse, being there by yourself with your family or having 400 misfits join you that are as dysfunctional as they can be? But what does David do with that? He, he turns those misfits into David's mighty men. What, a, what an attribute of a leader to take a situation and transform it into something an army that he never left lost a battle. Did you know that David never lost a battle? That's an amazing thing. So, John, the Apostle John, was put on the island of Patmos. He wrote the book of Revelation. Or the Apostle Paul was in prison several times. He wrote many of the epistles while he was isolated. Or how about John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. He was put in prison for 12 years for preaching the gospel. And what happened from that? He wrote one of the great classics, Pilgrim's Progress. So, if you get put in a place of isolation, beware. <laughs> God might allow a download to come to you for a purpose that he might share with others later. When I went through my period of isolation where I wrote the devotional, the Lord showed me that I was living out Isaiah 45, 3 that says, I will give you the treasures of darkness, secrets in hidden places that you might know me. And that was really true. So, isolation. So the next phase now is the cross phase. And the cross phase, I noticed that took place in almost every leader again. And invariably, every leader would have someone that would betray them. David had his son even betray him. Jesus had Judas. Moses had Korah. You just look at all the leaders that at some point along the line, someone betrayed them. And I call this the graduate level test. And Jesus is saying, are you willing to walk my walk? Are you willing to forgive your Judas? Are you willing to wash the feet of your Judas? In fact, he goes so far to say, if you're not willing to forgive, then I'm not willing to forgive. That's a hard one there. The implication of that. I had like four major betrayals in my life over my 25 years or so, and I'll never forget one of them was a, a guy that was mentoring me, and um, it was a painful one. And he, he turned on me, and he began spreading things about me, and I actually helped him publish a book, and I was selling that book. And so one day I'm thinking, well, surely I can't do that anymore. You know, look what he's doing. And then the Holy Spirit reminded me, what part of that thing about blessing your enemies did you not understand? <laughs> Which part did you miss about forgiving those who wrongfully accuse you? And I had to repent and continue to bless him and continue to sell his book. <laughs> so the cross, I'm crucified with Christ Nevertheless, I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live, I live by the faith in the Son of God. And so, walking the cross. In fact, I often say that the cross, even if you're a committed, passionate Christian and willing to go to the cross, you know, you couldn't put but two nails in your own cross, right? So... God helps us out by raising up someone else to put the third nail in, usually through a betrayal. <laughs> the next stage now 
we're in stage five, and it's the problem-solving stage. And now we're kind of in the fruitful side. God has prepared us through these first four stages, and now we're in the fruitful stage. And so it's problem-solving. What I noticed in the Scripture was that when you look at the life of Jesus, He often did something with every person He met. He solved the problem. When He first met uh, Peter, He solved his fishing problem. When He had a tax problem, He said, now go catch a fish, and in that fish's mouth there's going to be a coin, and you're going to be able to pay your taxes with that coin. He solved the feeding the 5,000 problem. He solved the problem for the prostitute who was about to get stoned. He solved Lazarus's problem. So every situation you see where Jesus solved a problem. And what was the net result of problem solving for him? It resulted in influence. You know, Jesus never used his influence for the wrong reason. He always did it in alignment with the purposes of God. And so as a result of that, people were attracted to him, and, and he had greater and greater influence. You know, people don't care who solves their problem. They just want their problem solved. If you solve a problem you'll gain influence. That's what what happened with Joseph. He solved the problem for Pharaoh. That's what happened with Daniel. Daniel's employer said, "You, you need to tell me my dream and you need to interpret my dream and if you don't, I'm going to kill you along with your three friends and your administration. Now, that's a difficult boss. (laughs) And so, He goes to his friends, and they pray, and God miraculously gives him the dream, and he solves the problem. So, as a result of solving the problem, something happens. His life is saved, his friends' lives are saved, his administration is saved, and he gets a raise, and God's name is protected. Now, that's a picture of transformation. If you want to see a community transformed, just start solving the problems in the community. Go to the mayor and say, Mayor, what's your top three problems? We as the church will start helping to solve them. You start doing that, he'll give you other problems to solve. (laughs) But imagine if, you know, all the churches in the community came together and decided, we're going to help you solve a problem. You'd transform the community. So, the last stage is networks, and I've noticed that God is evidently really into networks, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Twelve. And Jesus prayed a prayer in John 17, 21 to 23, he said, I pray that they might be one as you and I are one in order that they might believe in me. So there was a definite thing that if you do this, this will happen. And we have a body of Christ that's often divided over things, don't we? But networks are powerful because when you operate within the context of a network, you can leverage one another's resource, and that's... uh, That's really what Jesus did with the Twelve. One of my favorite examples of that is William Wilberforce in England who came to Christ when he was 28 years old. And he he came out of a very wealthy family, the aristocracy in England. And uh, he came out of a community called Clapham. Clapham. And, And so in his biography, he shows how John Newton, who wrote uh, Amazing Grace, was a former slave owner, and he was a mentor to William Wilberforce. And uh, so when, when Wilberforce came to Christ, he says, I think I'm going to be a pastor. And Newton said, no, you're not. <laughs> you're going to stay right there in politics because that's where God's called you. 
And so he was able to help him understand his spiritual call to being in politics. And so as a result, after 30 years of work, he was able to abolish slavery. But not only that, he was part of a group called the Clapham Group. There were about 17 individuals that hung out together. And uh, they were reformers. Some were landowners. Some were people who uh, were wealthy. Some were one person was a craftsman who made these little uh, coins that would uh, share the campaign to overturn slavery. And together, they leveraged their resources and were able to make a big impact. 69 different world-changing initiatives as a result. And so, you see the value of a network and, and coming together for purposes. And so, we see now these six things, recruitment, character, isolation, the cross, problem-solving, and networks. And, and you may see yourself in those six stages of your life. I've discovered that it's a process that God takes people through. And you know, it's helpful to know God's processes. I know that that was a life-changing encounter when I met Gunnar Olson then because he had an understanding of a process that I didn't understand. But by understanding it, I could embrace the journey. And sometimes when you know why you're going through an adversity, it's easier to embrace it, isn't it? Or at least fight through it. And so I want to encourage you if you're not living the larger story of your life, and it doesn't matter whether you're young, middle-aged, or you're in retirement. If you're still here, there's an assignment for you. Otherwise, you'd be home. <laughs> so you're not out of the woods. You know, Moses started at 80. Some of you folks are in your retirement now. You're not off the hook yet. <laughs> so... I want to challenge you with a prayer today, and it goes like this. Father, I want to give you permission to do anything in my life that would allow me to fulfill my complete purpose in life, that I would fulfill a larger story of my life. I wonder if you'd be willing to pray that prayer. It's giving God permission to take you. You know, the word inheritance is mentioned 237 times in the Bible. That means that God thinks inheritances are important. I used to think, well, why do I, why do I care what my inheritance is? I'm just going to get up there and be with Jesus, and we're going to have a great time. But he thinks it's a big deal. So if it's a big deal to him, it should be a big deal to me. And so... The greatest disappointment we could all have is get up there and there'd be two tables. One over here is, is what my inheritance was. And then get over here and there's a table here. These are all the things I wanted your inheritance to be, but because you didn't step into them, I couldn't give them to you. We don't want to get to heaven and be part of that story. So would you bow with me as we close and just uh, ask God to allow your heart to connect with that question. So, Father, I just come right now and I ask you, Lord God, to search our hearts to see where we are in this process of living our larger story. And I ask you now, Father, we, we come and we say to you, Father, we give you permission to do anything in our life if it means that we will fulfill the complete destiny and purpose for our life, no matter, no matter what that means. And we want to get to heaven and, and get to that table and see that we've, by faith, received everything we res you had in mind when you said in Ephesians 2.10 that you created us for good works from the very foundation of the earth. And so, Lord, we want to receive all you have for us, and we want to fulfill every purpose and destiny 
that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Oz. So as the Lord will often do, the last hymn's a perfect echo of what you just prayed. There's no way to, to say, Lord, I'll give you permission to work in my life unless you also can say, I'm going to trust and obey you. That's our closing hymn. As we sing that hymn, that's sort of your way of affirming what you just prayed. So if you prayed that with all your heart and you're sincere about giving God permission to work in